Hi, Martha. Hey, Julie. Boy, your skin looks so clear and healthy lately. What's your secret? I kidnap virgins and bathe in their blood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, goofball. Give it up. Oh, well, it's really very simple. It's Crowley time. Hello, and welcome to Crowley Time with me, Tom Crowley. With me, Tom Crowley. Well, after all the to-do with having my show stolen away and replaced with a provincial detective programme, then getting it back again when the detective show proved unsuccessful... See Crowley Time episode 30, true believers. Make mine madrigal. I'm just overjoyed to be back here at the helm of the best, and only, except for one or two others, solo sketch comedy audio production on the whole internet. And to celebrate the relaunch of Crowley Time, I'm putting on something very exciting. I always like to keep an eye on what the industry leaders are doing, and taking inspiration from creatively vibrant ventures like Mamma Mia! The Party, Priscilla! The Party, and the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime, A Forking Good Night, I've staged a brand new immersive Crowley Time cocktails and costumes party experience to accompany the programme. It's called Crowley Time Party Time, and it features themed cocktails, professional-grade set decoration for the space, a DJ or Spotify playlist, whichever's more cost-effective, and all your favourite characters. Not me, obviously. The pay's not good enough. They'll just find some recent drama school graduates with beards, I expect. And who are they? Well, I've contracted a top-flight events company called Luxury Ents to put it together. They did some really huge ones of these, like Hamilton, The Room Where the Party Happens, Scarface, Say Hello to My Little Friend Who Is Throwing a Party, and Wolf of Wall Street, Now You Have an Excuse for Acting Like a Prick. And Crowley Time Party Time sounds just as exciting as all of those. Listen to some of the plans that their creative director outlined at our meeting. So, by this time, the tossers should be absolutely shit-faced, right? And that's when we hit them with the laser light display that matches up with the theme song. Oh, cool. The music's going to be deafening and there's lasers. They come in hard. So the punters are going to be scared. They'll be pissing themselves, dropping to their knees, praying for mercy, all sorts. Uh, do, do we want them to be scared? Yes, we absolutely do. Because you know what scared people do? Uh, Buy more drinks. Oh, oh, great. But uh, isn't all this getting a bit expensive? Yes, that's why we're going to charge 80 quid a head. Oh, all right. Yeah, so after the lasers, we announce two-for-one shots at the bar. And once everybody's got basted again, bang, lights come up, here comes the Marco de Pony dancers. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and they're absolutely terrifying. Right. Pretty tantalising, hey, listeners. Well, the show opens today, so listen out later for details on how you can book a Crowley time party time for yourself very soon. But for now, let's get back to what we do best. Popping into worlds unknown, meeting old friends and new unsavoury people, and maybe, just maybe, learning a little bit about ourselves along the way. Welcome back to Crowley Time, humanity. Coming soon to Plus Max Go Extreme Flavor and to a cinema in Bangor for one day so it's eligible for the Oscars. Hello, I'm John. I'd like a baguette. Hello, I have not seen you in my boulangerie before. I'm new to the area, having spent several years fighting the fascists in the Spanish Civil War and the following few years hiding out in a vineyard in the Dordogne. As a girl who has lived only in this small Loire Valley village all my life, except for a brief period when I was hospitalized in Paris with polio as a child, I have no knowledge of these things. Put down that baguette, Francine. I love you. I love you too. Let's get married. Good idea. Oh no. What was that? The Second World War just started. From the producers of The Life of a Real Musician played by a really good actor who looks a bit like them. And a historical event of too large a scale to adequately summarize in a film. You're in pretty rough shape, soldier. Yes, that's why I'm here in this military hospital in northern France. I'm Pat, an English nurse who will minister to you both physically in patching up your numerous shrapnel wounds and emotionally in falling in love with you during your convalescence. I'm John. I'll take solace in your tender embrace because I'm I'm traumatized from my battlefield experience and ashamed of myself and my adopted homeland after the French surrender at Compiègne. I remind you of your English mother. War is monstrous and achieves nothing. A film based on a really, really long book. John, 
John, is that you? Right there, just one bed over from me. My God, it's Henry, my old friend from my past life studying at Cambridge. That's right. And even with both my arms blown off, I still say that what we Brits are doing, marching into Europe, risking our lives to beat back the Nazis, is honourable and right. Henry, if you and your optimism can survive this mire of brutality, then perhaps there's some kind of crazy sense to this war after all. Here, here. Schnell! Henry! Two producers. Three directors and eight screenwriters were driven to nervous breakdowns trying to condense all 1,300 pages of this epic tome into something resembling a feature film screenplay. Gosh, it certainly is difficult and morally complex doing aid work for German refugees in Yugoslavia now that the war's over. Yes. Fortunately, I have you and our three children back in England to comfort me. Speaking of which, I'd better get back to them. Little Horatio is starting school soon. I'll join you soon, my love. Just as soon as I've rehoused these 400,000 displaced people. I'll keep your dinner warm in the oven. Now, the next refugee's name is... Francine. Yes, my love, it is I. What happened to your family's boulangerry? Blown up. Then I roamed France trying to evade the fighting for the rest of the war, occasionally moonlighting as a radio operator and demolitions expert for the French resistance. Then, after VE Day, I ended up here. While you were saying that, I fell so deeply in love with you that I've forgotten my wife Pat and our three beautiful children in England. And now I want to abandon my duties here and run away with you to rural Italy for the rest of our lives. Hmm, c'est la vie. Just a sec. I'll write a letter telling my wife I died. This epic saga moves along at an average in-universe pace of two days per second of screen time, and we could still barely get the cuts down to three and a half hours. Bongiorno. Hello, father. It's me, Horatio, your eldest son. I'm a man now. Gosh, is it the 70s already? Mother's heart was broken when she got your letter, and she died a few years later, leaving we, your children, to be raised by unpleasant cousins. When I found out that you'd faked your death, I vowed that I'd find you and kill you as revenge for your betrayal. Go ahead, son. Kill me if you want. But if I've learned one thing through the rich themes underpinning my life, it's that killing is pointless and destroys the perpetrator as surely as it destroys the victim. John, who is this young man? Seeing this woman look at you with such love makes me feel disgust at the idea of sinking to your level and making her a widow. Bye. Bye. A tale so moving, so involving, it'll be at least two hours before you start to question whether this was really the right medium for an adaptation of this story. Hello, John. It is I, Salvador Dali. The workings of men on this earth are surreal, are they not? Rather like life. Ha ha! So, sorry, what is this? What's happening? I'm having trouble seeing where this fits into the larger arc of my life. It doesn't, John, my friend. They had to cut all the context out for this moment, but this is just such an iconic scene in the book that they couldn't leave it out of the movie. I see. Pretty surreal, no? Ha <laughs> ha! The problem is, a movie being one standalone story is under pressure to powerfully evoke one focused theme or idea. And a novel of this size, by its very nature, incorporates so many vast concepts that it doesn't yield easily to such a condensed medium, said the New York Times. Francine, my love, I've got some Oscar-worthy old-age makeup prosthetics on, which means I'm dying. Yes, John, you are dying. From the pneumonia you've contracted due to exhaustion from working in the vineyard which we own together, where you finally found true happiness and satisfaction, the irony being that you derived said happiness from helping something to live and grow, and it is that thing that is eventually killing you. Oh dear, I am so sad. Francine, before I depart this multi-layered and complex life of mine, there is one thing I must say. What is that, my darling? The last her third of my life was a metaphor for the ever-present threat of nuclear war. Goodbye. No. A film based on a really, really long book. See it so you can pretend you read it. The ever-present threat of nuclear war. Now that really is surreal, no? Ha-ha! Oh, shut up, Dolly. Oh, that looked brilliant. I can't wait to miss that at the cinema, put off watching it on streaming for months, then eventually stick it on and fall asleep halfway through. The golden age of home entertainment. Now, let's see if anyone's been ringing in. Crowley time coming back, the new immersive experience. There's so much to talk about. It's time you had your say. Hello, this is Crowley time with me, Tom Crowley with me, Tom Crowley. We can't take your call at the moment. Please leave your message after the tone. Hello, yes. I think that in the next one, Madrigal should fight Muhammad Ali on top of a mountain. Thank you. Right. Maybe not everybody's got the message yet. Thanks for the call, anyway. But we talked about... Yes, but we had an understanding. I thought we'd already said... Yes, including the amendment, that's what you... Oh, don't you... 
Oh, then forget it. Forget the whole thing. Side with Bennett. Go on. I'm sure the opposition will be very grateful. Grr! Useless bloody man. Doesn't sound very promising, sir. I need a drink. Are you sure that's wise? Maybe you're right. I need a clear head. It's all slipping away from me, Stafford. We had this whole motion sewn up and then Clark, Barrington, and now a Bailey. They'll take 30, 35 members with them and then... The nays have it. Like a bloody stables in gelding season. I'm losing hold of it, Stafford. I'm, I'm losing control. Well, sir, there are measures we can take. Measures? What do you mean? All in good time. But if you'll excuse me, sir, first, before I pass this request along to my friends, I need to be sure that you mean what you say. Mean what I say? I'm a government minister, for Christ's sake. Mm, so you can understand my uncertainty. Cheeky sod. Well, fine, yes, I'm serious. I need control. I need the party behind me again. I need to get my grip back. A firm grip? Yes, damn you! A steady hand, or total control. How tight a grip do you mean, Minister? This is what I need to be sure about. Ah, I see. Well, you can be assured. I want a grip as tight as... Mm. How to put it? I have to be sure, sir. Wait, wait. I know. You know in those moments when you're at home on your own, and all is quiet and still, and the silence is everywhere, it's smothering, and it makes you start to question everything. Your priorities in life, the creed you've lived by, your purpose on this earth, even the evidence of your own eyes. You start to doubt even the things you're seeing right in front of your face, and you're just standing in the middle of the living room, staring out of the window, now utterly certain that none of it's real, that none of it means anything. The boy on the bicycle, the postman with his trolley, all just a dream. And that's when Trelawney the Grey Shadow comes to you. And at first he just stands in the doorway, only showing you half of himself. But then inside you know you've already welcomed him in. And he feels it too, he knows. And he walks into the room and up close to you, ever so slowly and takes your hand in his. And his hand is ice cold and hard like plastic, but it's alive, it's moving. And at first, his grip is gentle, but the longer he holds you, the tighter and tighter it gets, until the pain is almost unbearable. But you can't pull it away, and you can't scream, and you don't want to. Because no matter how awful the pain is, you know that it's real. That this, at least, is real. And you say it, you say to yourself, over and over again, this is real, this is real. You know that feeling? Yes, of course. Well, about that tight. Great. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. We'll sort out Clark and the others for you. Well, hang on. What are you going to do? Oh, we're going to blackmail them with photos of them having sex with prostitutes. Oh, splendid. Fancy a drink now? Oh, yes, please. Yes, well, I was rather interested in visiting your so-called Crowley Time Party Time event until I found out that alcoholic drinks were going to be served. It's such a shame that some people think they need to resort to the demon drink to have a good time. At my church, it's just a couple of hits off the bong before Evensong, and that's quite enough for us, thank you very much. Well, to each their own, I suppose. Still... I'm glad the word's getting out about Crowley Time Party Time. The first guests should be getting in just about now. Oh, gosh, I'm all a flutter. I was hoping for an update from Luxury Ents just to confirm that they were ready to open the doors, but uh, no, nothing yet. Probably too busy with all the lasers and everything to set up. <laughs> I'm sure we'll hear from them soon. Until then, this. I'm seeing here, it appears that you've answered all of our questions fully, frankly, and with admirable consideration. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Bismuth. And now comes the really nice part of my job. 
Congratulations, Ms. Norton. The Bisexual Dog Trust is now granted official charitable status. Oh, the bisexual dogs will be so happy. I'm sure they will. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Now, next up, we have Mr... Clint. Harry Clint, sir. Mr. Clint. Now, how can the Charity Commission help you? Thanks for asking, sir. Thanks awfully for your time. That's quite all right. What is the nature of your charitable venture? Well, sir, I'm very passionate about this cause. It's very close to my heart. I'm sure, I'm sure. Which is why it's long been my dream to set up an organisation to help Britain's thick people. Oh, uh, mm, not that I doubt your sincerity, Mr. Clint, but I'm not sure that's the appropriate terminology these days. Oh, no, no, sorry, please don't misunderstand me, Mr. Bismuth. Uh, these people aren't disabled or suffering from any sort of learning difficulty or anything. This is quite thick. You're losing me, Mr. Clint. It really is as simple as it sounds, sir. Uh, how else can I put it? Uh, they just don't have anything about them. Anything about them? Yeah. That's right. Not much at all. Not much at all about them. Yeah, they're dullards. Thickos, you know. No, Mr. Clint, I'm not entirely sure that I do know. If you'd come in here and told me that you had a son who had lived with ADHD or dyslexia or something, and you wanted to set up a charity to raise awareness of their situation, I'd have been right there with you. I'm sorry to say that my son doesn't live with either of those complaints, Mr. Bismuth. That's all right. Uh, no, I mean... Uh, Look, could you perhaps be a bit more specific? How does this thickness manifest itself? Well, that's easy, sir. At Help the Thick UK, this is our principal area of concern. To sum it up, these people, well, uh, they're always doing thick things or saying something really, really thick. They think Torremolinos is a skin complaint. They need instructions to use toothpaste. They wash their clothes by going in the shower fully dressed. You're absolutely thick as two short planks, honestly. It's a terrible shame for them. But they, them, who are these people? There's William. William? Yeah, he's quite thick. Yes, but who is William? Oh, William's a friend of my son. Your son who has not ADHD nor dyslexia? Neither of those, I'm afraid. But he is thick. Oh, no, no, excuse me, sir. My son's not thick. No, no, of course. His friend William's thick. Oh, good lord, yes. All right, let's take another approach to this. Could you please tell me... Shall we say, the most recent way in which your son's friend William exhibited his thick nature? Oh, that's easy, sir. Dolly good. He were out to play with my son, whose name is Nathan. Yes, best to be clear on the details. And Nathan played green sleeves for William on his recorder, which he's recently learned to do. How did William respond? Well, misunderstanding the workings of the recorder, William grabbed the nearest object to hand, which was a courgette, and attempted to get a tune out of it by blowing very hard into its end. Oh, dear. Oh, dear is right sir for William was so determined in his attempts that he kept blowing into or onto the courgette until he went blue in the face and then lost consciousness good gracious did your son not think it was worth intervening before that point my son wasn't able to help him at the time because of too much laughing how old is Nathan nine sir and William 14 sir Mm, it's a bit unusual, isn't it, for children of such different ages to be friends? Yes, well, William's more comfortable around the younger children because he's, he's so, so thick. thick. Yes, I'm getting the picture. And you're telling me beyond a shadow of a doubt that William has no diagnosable condition or disease or cranial injury? No, no, goodness me, sir, no. He's just a bit lacking in the upstairs department, that's all. Which is to say... He's a bit thick, sir. Is this a joke? Is this some sort of wind-up, Mr. Clint? I don't know what you mean, sir. I am beginning to suspect that this entire enterprise is a ruse. A ruse designed to mock this institution and the very charitable organisations you yourself are tastelessly parodying. No, sir, not at all. I take exception to that. I just wanted to do something nice for the Dumbos, that's all. Right, that does it. Mr. Verrier, could you show Mr. Clint out, please? Sorry, Mr. Bismuth, but if I might interject... Yes, what is it? I have some idea of what Mr. Clint is talking about. You see, my father was thick. What? Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Verrier. Yes, a Class A dunderhead. He would quite often put gloves on his feet by mistake, and he died trying to cut his own hair with a chainsaw. Oh, Mr. Verrier, really? It's true, sir. I know just what you mean. My cousin also died of being a thicko. Oh, really? Yes, he found this bone, you see, and he was carrying it in his mouth. On his way home, he stopped to look into a pond. In there, he saw a man with a bone in his mouth, and he thought to himself, that bone looks bigger than mine, I wish I had that bone instead. So he plunged yes, into... Yes, I think I can see where this is going. Right, well, unlikely, though I find it, that there is a category of person who can fairly and accurately be described as just thick, 
You, in tandem with Mr. Verrier of this Board of Review, have convinced me that such a group exists, whatever their more accurate classification might be, and that they could use some help. Quite right, sir. Hear, hear. So I see no reason why... Uh, help the thick UK should not be granted charitable status. Thank you very much, sir. Good on you, Mr. Bismuth. But once you've raised some funds for these thickos, Mr. Clint, just what are you going to do for them? Well, sir, I thought I'd buy them a great big house in the country, out where they can run around and they won't be in anyone's way, without too many sharp corners about, with a big telly so they can watch Fast and the Furious. And you think this will help them? Oh, yes. As long as I can work out the remote control. Then off you go and... Good luck to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The Thick owe you a great debt. Yes, thank you. I'm sure they do. Who's next on the list, Veria? Um, the campaign for real boobs. I think we'll call that lunch, shall we? Very good, sir. The only event I ever went to was a wine tasting, and I can't say I enjoyed it. You see, they were just swishing it round in their mouths and spitting it out whereas I was loading the bottles into my van behind their backs and selling them down the market at a knockdown rate. Some people. Tch! <laughs> Snobs. Right then, listeners, it's around this time each episode that oh, we... Uh, sir, Mr Crowley, sir, hold oh, all oh, me knees. Ah, oh. Savaloy, I was about to come and see you. <laughs> How's that for service, eh, listeners? My postmaster Savaloy has brought the letters to me. No, no, sir, it's not that. Have you seen... Have you got the listeners' letters, Savaloy? Well, yes, but I think you ought to... Well, give them here, then. Uh, all right, but honestly, sir, I think this Thanks is... Thanks to everyone who wrote in since the last episode. Let's see here. The first message is from Philip Chersick via this show's Patreon page. Remember, patreon.com forward slash Crowley time if you'd like to help support the show. And Philip says of the last episode, I finally got around to listening to this today and it was truly fantastic. Snappy, pithy, very funny. I listened to it twice, back to back, on my walk today and picked up lots of details on the second lap that I missed first time through. Great job, cheers, Philip. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you, Philip. Or at least I would be saying that, except that the last episode was the one where Crowley time was replaced by boilerplate crime drama Madrigal, so I can't say I agree with your assessment, Philip, but thanks for writing in anyway. No accounting for taste, eh, Savaloy? Certainly not, sir, but honestly, I really think you And it looks like there's a theme to these next two. Listen, the first is from Marcus Ponting. Hi, your podcast was recommended on another podcast called Three Bean Salad, so I gave it a listen and immediately loved it. Within 24 hours, I was signed up to your Patreon. So I just wanted to email and say thank you for the amazing content. Regards, Marcus Ponting. Thank you, Marcus, and thanks especially for signing up to the Patreon. Yes, if you didn't know, towards the end of last year, this show was recommended on the podcast Powerhouse of Lukewarm Banter, Three Bean Salad. And I know quite a few of you listening now have discovered this show as a result of that. So I'd like to thank Thank the Beans, Ben Partridge, Mike Wozniak and Henry Packer from the bottom of my heart for their endorsement. And to welcome all you new listeners, one of whom is Trevor Post, who wrote in to say, Hello Mr Crowley, my name is Trevor and I'm listening to your podcast starting today on the recommendation of the three Beans. I'm an instant fan of yours and of your show, just as those Beans predicted. I'm doing a Merlin listen, which is when you listen from the most recent episode backwards, an awkward description of listening I heard once on a subreddit for another podcast I won't mention because I doubt you'll be hot for me buzz marketing a bunch of other podcasts like I've already done. Anyway, you're very funny and I love your show and I just wanted to tell you that. Thank you for what you're doing. Trevor, thank you so much, both for your kind words and for introducing me to the concept of a Merlin listen. I shall be stealing that phrase and using it in my everyday life and I encourage all you other listeners to do the same. And just one last email for this episode from Charlotte Parks, who says... Hi, Tom. Thanks for producing this brilliant podcast. I started listening a few weeks ago. Your work has brightened my days considerably. I find myself laughing at random times when I remember a bit. It can be difficult to explain since I work on a crisis helpline. Brackets, kidding about laughing while on a call. Oh, thank God for that. I thought I'd have to talk to a tribunal or something. Charlotte continues, I very much want to listen to the good boy sketch again from early on in the podcast. What episode is it? Uh, Charlotte, I believe the sketch you're looking for is Mr. Boxer's press conference way back in episode 8. You're welcome. But given your very worthy work for the helpline, I can't help but think you need an even greater reward. So I'm making you... Letter of the episode! And since you're... Letter of the episode! 
you'll be receiving a free digital download of Discount Bin, this show's first and so far only soundtrack album. Thanks to all of you for writing in, and thanks also to all my new listeners. Maybe if you've just discovered the show, you'd like to write in and let me know your favourite bits at crowleytimepodcast at gmail.com. That's crowleytimepodcast at gmail.com. And who knows, you could be... Letter of the Episode! Also, just to reciprocate, if any of you poor deprived souls have never heard Three Bean Salad, then it is one of the easiest recommendations I've ever made. If you like this show, you'll love the beans, so do yourself a favour and look them up today. Isn't that nice, Savaloy? A bit so of a... bloody heck, now will you please look here? Look at what? At the internet. The Crowley Time Party Time Party's all over the place. It's gone infectious. You mean viral? That's good, isn't it? You think so? Look! Oh, what? Look, there's, there's nothing here. It's just an empty underground car park with a couple of old tractor tyres strewn about. Who are you supposed to be? I'm Tom Crowley. With Tom Crowley. With Tom Crowley. Give me 20 quid. What? Why? I said give me 20 fucking quid. Oh, oh. That... N- no. No, that can't... Uh, that's the man I met with from Luxury Ents, but... But that... Uh, that's not what it's supposed to be like at all. This is from today. Hot off the presses, sir. And there's more. Oh, oh, what are you doing? Don't touch me. Oh, I'm Wingnut. I want to climb into your brain and give you oh, agony. Oh, oh, Jesus Christ, this is horrible. Get away from me. I love you, Mummy. Oh, my God. No, 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 it can't all be like that. And more. What is that? It's Trelawney, the Grey Shadow. No, it isn't it? That's just a cleaner with a carrier bag stuck on his head. Give Trelawney 20 quid or he'll hurt you. Well, I'm getting out of here. 20 fucking quid. <laughs> Savaloy. Yes, sir? I've been diddled. Yes, sir. This is unacceptable. No drinks, no attractions, no terrifying lasers. This is a complete rip-off, unlike all the other fine products available from Crowley Time Enterprises. Uh, I'm going to call Luxury Ents right now and get some answers. Good idea, Mr Crowley. What's their number? Uh, I don't know, sir. Thus far, they've only communicated via index cards shoved under the door. Uh, I should have known something was off when their business address was for the public bogs in B&M. Right, well, I'm going to have to do some digging. Meanwhile, Savaloy, cue Chuntley. Absolutely, sir. Cue Sir Chuntley Buffingham. Spooky tidings to thee, listeners. I'm Sir Chuntley Buffingham, actor, raconteur, and active member of the British Erotic Bobblehead Collectors Association, or BEBCA, and welcome to my drama parlour. Here I bring you tales of terror, pain, evil, excitement, and the thrill you get when you're at the supermarket checkout and the lady at the till rings through two bananas as only one by mistake, and you wonder, what if I didn't correct her? Tonight's sordid little yarn is a window into the blood, booze, and compressed meat-filled world of organised crime in 1960s London. Ah, the memories. It doesn't seem that long ago that I myself was sniffing Charlie with Reggie Cray at the Groucho Club. Or was that sniffing Reggie Cray with Groucho at the Charlie Club? Whatever the case, I seem to recall that I was entirely nude. But it is not my captivating stories that have lured you here, listener. So let's get on with tonight's terrifying tale. That being Solomon Funkmeister's short chiller... Who knows what harm? Desmond Des Renfrew could feel a blister developing on his right thumb. This was mildly irritating to him, but not as irritating as Bill Clatterman's encroaching threat to his stranglehold on London's drug networks had been. Which is why he had shot Bill Clatterman in the back of the head with a small snub-nosed pistol earlier that evening behind Wimpy's, and why he was now digging a shallow grave into which he hoped soon to tip Bill Clatterman's lifeless body. Hence the harsh rubbing of the spade on the pad of his thumb. Hence the blister. 
Des had put meticulous care into his choice of burial location, deep in the darkest recesses of Epping Forest. Before he had even set off that evening, he had consulted ordnance survey maps, wildlife surveys, and his old friend, the A to Z, to discover which was the thicket furthest from civilization, the most secluded from stray motorway headlamps, and the most lacking in any intriguing or exotic fauna. In short, the loneliest place this side of the North Sea. Once Bill was under this heavy, damp Essex sod, he'd never be heard from again. This thought was what pushed Des through the pain emanating from his postulant thumb. Excuse me, is this the way to the Burnie Inn? Des span around to see a young man and woman standing in the bushes, both peeping at him through inch-thick spectacles, hunched under heavy knapsacks with their corduroy trousers tucked into their thick woolen socks. Ramblers, the spanner in the murderer's bovril. Why, yes, replied Des, smiling extra wide and adopting his most charming oh-gosh posture to avoid the ramblers inspecting the shadows around his feet too closely. It's right behind you. The two turned obediently to look. I can't see anything, the woman protested. Keep looking, grinned Des, his finger tightening on the trigger. It's quite a small Bernie Inn. Only half an hour later, two fresh graves had been successfully dug, occupied and filled in, and Des's thumb hurt like a wasp with gonorrhea had been at it. Des hauled the third new permanent resident of the forest over his shoulder and carried her toward the last lonesome hole in the soil. I suppose this is the price of doing business, he mused to nobody in particular, and dreamed of the clink of ice cubes plopping into his whiskey glass at home. Not long now. Then a chirpy voice cut through the darkness. Avon calling! Des heaved a sigh. You're fucking joking. I was just passing and I thought your young lady friend might be interested in some of these fine cosmetics, chirruped the smartly dressed lady through the undergrowth. Though she does look a little worse for wear. Bang, replied Des's pistol. Then, just as Des was sloughing the second rambler into the ground, mentally sizing up the height of the Avon lady and making promises to his thumb of ointments and cotton wool, a figure leapt up from nowhere. A creature of the forest, seemingly composed of vegetation and produced by the forest floor itself. Now I really must protest, it said. You've had your fun, but it's time to move along. You're disturbing our survey. Des blinked at the gloom, and the leafy green forest elf before him transformed into a man carrying a clipboard dressed head to toe in woodland camouflage. Survey? asked Des, dreading the answer. Our nature survey! Come on, team! He barked, and a dozen or so other camouflaged surveyors emerged from the forest floor, all glaring with irritation at Des. The first surveyor continued. We've been here for days studying the possible effect of dangerous chemical spills on the region's wildlife. It's been going on for years, apparently. Who knows what harm could be done in these woods? Who indeed, murmured Des, counting the khaki-clad figures harumphing in the semi-darkness and tallying these against the remaining bullets in his cartridge. Several hours later, Des patted down the earth on his sixteenth shallow grave of the night, his hands now red raw, almost entirely covered in aching sores. He was a bent, trembling figure, his hot breath spurting from his body in ragged, spittle-laden clouds. His weak final swings of the spade were observed by nobody but a scrawny stray dog, which watched the tired man with the unconditional pity of the blissfully ignorant. Once Des had buried the dog, he collapsed to his knees and heaved three or four desperate gasps of air until he felt like he was capable of standing up again. No matter how long it had taken and what unfortunate detours he had made along the way, the job was done, his supremacy in the capital was assured, and he could go home. To a hot bath. To whiskey. To Nancy. But just as this glorious tableau flickered out of his mind, he noticed something that turned his blood to ice and sent a spasm of keening pain into his ravaged hands. One of the graves, the first he had dug, he was fairly sure, was open. Open and empty. He was suddenly aware that somebody was standing behind him. 
How long they had been there, he didn't know. But as he turned slowly to see, he somehow already knew what he would find. The dirt-caked corpse of Bill Clatterman, eyes hollow and unseeing, brain seeping through the bullet hole in his forehead, and a strange green shimmer seeming to envelop his whole form. What once was Bill lifted its arms and got a tight grip on Dez's throat. Its slack mouth lazily slurped itself around words. Chemical spills, it slurred. Who knows what harm? Oh well, thought Dez. At least the blisters won't bother me any more. The End Have you ever felt the avaricious eyes of a rival upon you, listeners? And have you wondered how far you'd go to fend off their attempts to usurp you? Maybe you could do what I did to a certain other young actor when we were both up for that Dracula thing in 78. Mash sleeping pills into his sandwiches on audition day and tell everyone at the studio he's a junkie. But whatever you do... Don't end up like poor Desmond Renfrew. Join me next time, listeners, for more tales of horror, intrigue, and semi-plausible leaps of logic in the drama parlor. Right, listeners, I've got hold of a number for Luxury Ents on the business card I got from their creative director back when I first met him. Good thing I found it when I did, though. It's almost completely dissolved. It's printed on a half-smoked cigarette paper. Very suspicious. All right, time to get some answers. <laughs> got you. What? Listen, I want to complain... But you about... never thought it'd be me behind the scenes, did you? My brilliant disguise fooled you. The mighty Tom Crowley, outwitted by a simple pair of glasses with a nose and a moustache attached to them. There is no luxury, Ents. The man who met with you, who made a mockery of your ridiculous podcast and trampled on your reputation, was in fact me all along. Well... Then it's you I want to talk to, because it's an absolute disgrace. N no, I mean, it, it, it's me, your arch-nemesis. Who? Me. Tim Crawley, your sworn enemy. Who? What? You don't know you've got a sworn enemy? Well, I've never heard of you, mate. I don't know any Tim Crawley. Well, I'm... I've sworn to dedicate my life to sabotaging all of your works and tarnishing your name. Why? Oh, that's a whole other thing. I'm not getting into that. Look, just feel really bad about yourself and know that everybody thinks you're horrible, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, and don't ever think about trying to get your money back or to settle those dissatisfied customers after me. You'll never track down the architect of your downfall. You won't even know his name. Apparently it's Tim Crawley. I wouldn't have known that, only you haven't stopped banging on about it. Baba booey, baba booey, Tom Crowley sucks. What is... Uh, well, I suppose I'll have to call the police now. Pain in the ass. I'd like to take this opportunity to apologise to anyone who bought tickets for Crowley Time Party Time, but if you want a refund, you'll have to get it from Tim Crawley, whoever he is. Maybe sometime you'll get to go to a real Crowley Time live show. But next time, I'm not getting any creepy events knobs involved. I'll do the whole thing myself. And we'll do it up proper, with horse riding and fireworks and a giant paella for all the children. Well, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. The fact of the matter is, the reason I even gave Luxury Ents the job in the first place is I've been rushed off my feet lately. It's been a Tom Crowley bonanza out there. In fact, there's so much to talk about, I don't have time to talk about it. So to tell you about it all, I'm going to hand over to somebody more qualified. Wesley Westchester, American game show host from the 50s. Hey folks, if you like Tom Crowley, have we ever got Tom Crowley for you? Tom Crowley is a writer on Marvel's new audio immersive fitness series, Marvel Move. He created and wrote a miniseries that plays alongside main adventure, Daredevil Terminal Degree. Get in shape with the man with no fear, and then meet college radio broadcasters Cat and Mason in the show's radio mode, entitled WHHK. Go to zrx.app forward slash Marvel for more information. Tom is also currently appearing as lead character Inspector Archibald Fleet in the new third season of alternate history comedy detective 
detective podcast drama serial Victoriosity. Listen to it now to find out who's been committing horrifically brutal murders in even greater London on your podcast app or at victoriosity.com. And look out for the new Victoriosity novel, High Voltage, that's V-A-U-L-T-A-G-E, by Jen and Chris Sugden for a whole new fleet and endless little mystery in a brand new medium. Still want more? Then check out the Kickstarter for a conspiracy sitcom True Tales of the Illuminati. The True Tales team are crowdfunding their third season, but they need your help. And if they make their $9,000 total, then you'll get to hear a brand new half-hour episode written by and starring Tom Crowley, entitled The Quibblerman Conundrum. Want more podcast drama but want true history not made up? Then you can hear Tom in two episodes of The Nordland Railway, Tracks of War, The Nordland Theater, and Boda 24's Radio History of the Turbulent Completion of the Titular Norwegian Railway during the Second World War. If that's still not enough, you'll hear Tom returning to the award-winning Beef and Dairy Network podcast soon in episode 107, bringing back a fan-favorite character on your podcast app and at benjaminpartridge.com. And if you're still not satisfied, if you still need more, more, more Tom Crowley, then keep an eye out for the next thing coming from the team behind children's sci-fi adventure series The Res. You can hear Tom in the already released season two by searching The Res, R-E-Z, on your podcast app or going to jointherez.com. But something even more exciting is coming soon, and it's got even more Tom Crowley. That's all the Tom Crowley that's fit to Tom Crowley. Why don't you Tom Crowley today? Now back to you, Tom Crowley. Thanks, Wesley. Blimey, that is a lot. Nevertheless, the thing I'm most excited about is bringing Crowley time magic to you, my lovely loyal audience, and I hope I'll have more for you very soon. If you want to speed my hand and lubricate my comedy pipes, there's no better way than joining this show's Patreon. For just £2 per episode or local equivalent, you can support me in making this show and in making it more of a going professional concern for me, giving me more permission to fob off other things in favour of producing audio sketch comedy giblets. I'm sorry, I can't come to your child's christening. I have to stay in and make more Crowley time. It's so lucrative! That's the sort of thing I'd love to be able to say. And by going to patreon.com forward slash Crowley time, you can make that dream a reality. You'll also get a piece of exclusive bonus material for every episode released, and access to all bonus material, past, present, and future, for as long as you support the show. But whether you're paying for this or not, thank you, truly, for listening. The next episode will be released when Christopher Nolan first thinks, maybe this bit could be shorter. So make sure to subscribe, so you'll be alerted at the precise moment that happens. Everything you've just heard was made by me, Tom Crowley, with a special guest appearance by Thomas Ellis. Please submit all praise, questions, or complaints to at a Tom Crowley on social media or email crowleytimepodcast at gmail.com. To help increase my terrifying laser budget, go to patreon.com forward slash crowleytime and become a supporter today. Or go to crowleytime.com and buy some of the show's merchandise or its soundtrack album. And remember... Nobody ever got rich throwing seashells over a bridge. But maybe you could be the first. Think you've heard the last of me, do you? Well, I promise I'll get you next time, Crowley. Next time! Yes? Mr. Crawley, I'm afraid you're under arrest on a charge of fraud. I've got to take you in for questioning. Oh, poo. No need for that language, sir.